Hey everyone, Couch Investor back with another video for today. So in today's video, I'm interviewing Mark Frohmeyer, the CEO of Arkimoto. It's an awesome interview. We talk about his past before Arkimoto, the start of Arkimoto, the difficulties of starting a three-wheeled EV company, obviously the growth as well, and the plans for the future. We'll talk about the pilots, the FUV, the Roadster, etc. You're going to hear all of that in this interview. But the beginning part of this interview was actually cut. Just the two first minutes was cut by Zoom. So I just asked him what he was doing before Arkimoto. He was basically the lead programmer of uh, Star Siege, Tribe and Tribe 2 at Dynamics. And then you will see what, what he continues on answering to that question. So without further ado, enjoy the interview. Programmer, uh, basic and assembly language and C, and then uh, went to Berkeley to get a degree in electrical engineering and computer science. And that my focus there was almost entirely on software engineering. So uh, computer programming and uh, I mean, just the, the, the whole uh, range of things that you learn in that realm. Um, and then moved back actually to uh, my hometown of Eugene, Oregon to work for a company called Dynamics, which made Tribes and Tribes 2, along with, uh, you know, a whole bunch of flight simulators. And um, uh, uh, my time there, I spent working uh, on a mix of things, but I, I did a lot of engineering, you know, kind of deep engine programming. So um, uh, network simulation, 3D graphics, uh, scripting languages, and and then in two, uh, right around 2001 was when we got started with Garage Games, and we actually took a lot of the technology that we developed at Dynamics uh, and spun out a new company in order to bring um, that uh, the 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 capability of of high-end game engines to everybody so at the time that we started uh, garage games if you wanted to license a, a commercial grade game engine you think these are things like the the quake engine uh from id software or the unreal engine from epic um so it was it was hundreds of thousands of dollars plus royalties in order to license those yeah. technologies and we uh Garage Games was really founded uh, to as a, to harken back to the good old days of game development when you could have a small team of five to seven people working for less than a year and make a very compelling title. And so, you know, the, the idea was sort of like, well, if if, if guitars cost a hundred thousand dollars or five hundred thousand dollars, how many indie bands would you have? And we we saw a real need to help spawn the uh, independent game development movement. And that's really what Garage Games was all about, was building the community, building the tool sets, and ultimately building our own games um, in, the, uh, in the kind of indie gaming space. And, and I think we were, you know, certainly a part of that whole movement really kicking off in the early 2000s. All right. And how, how did you make the, the switch from going from games into a three-wheeled electric vehicle right. type it's, of company? It's totally natural transition. Yeah. Um, no, I, I actually, well, so we sold Garage Games in 2007. Uh, and that, you know, we'd, we'd started it all, it, we, we bootstrapped the whole thing. Uh, each of the four founders kicked in like 10,000 bucks at the start, and then we sold it um, for a substantial multiple beyond that. And um, that, at, at the time, I just sort of, thought, you know, how can I best use these resources um, that I've that I've now, uh, uh, you know, my, my ill gotten gains from the sale of the company, and put them to good use in the world. Um, I it was, I, at the, for me at that point, the writing of climate change was very obvious on the wall. Um, there, were, you know, the, the way that we treat the environment of the world around us um, uh, was was apparent and grotesque. And I thought, you know, what can I do with what was a pretty limited uh, still at, at that scale amount of cash to go after some real problems? Um, and at the same time, I went looking for a, an electric electric vehicle to buy uh, to get around town. So I was uh, I, I was at that time a bicycle commuter, but I'd gotten a house a year before. And there were just times where, you know, you needed to hit the. Uh, hit the Home Depot or go yeah. out for a big load of groceries or go meet somebody across town. And so the idea of uh, sedentary, reasonable speed transportation was not, not a bad one, but I, I didn't want a full-size car. I wanted something that was going to be affordable for just about anybody. 
I wanted something that was going to be cool, something that's going to be fun, something that's going to solve my day-to-day stuff, high quality product, and just couldn't find it in the market. Couldn't find anything close. Um, and that, I think it was that combination of looking for something that I wanted that I couldn't find and wanting to deploy the, the cash that I'd gotten out of the sale of garage games in some meaningful way uh, for the betterment of the world that led me to ultimately start Arkimoto. And I, I think the, the real catalyst was I, I saw a parade uh, in Eugene and these three-wheeled kit vehicles called the Buggy went ripping by and you know, giant grins plastered on the faces of the drivers. And it was just like, that was that, was that light bulb moment where, it, uh, where, where I realized that there was really realized that there was a giant gap between the bike and the car and that there was an opportunity to build something in that gap. And so getting the, getting a couple of the kits, uh, putting, uh, putting them together, I c- kind of cajoled some friends to help put them together. Um, that was what let me believe that it was actually possible to develop a new vehicle in this gap. Um, and, uh, I think I was, I came out of, uh, garage games with a certain amount of irrational exuberance from, you know, a first successful exit on, uh, you know, it's like, it's like, if you, if you step up to bat and, and you've never played baseball before and you hit a home run, uh, you, you will be left with the mistaken notion that baseball is an easy game to play. Yeah. Um, but I think that was, that was part of what got me, that was certainly what got me started. Um, and then I was, I obviously got in way over my head very quickly uh, and sort of went all in um, and and have just sort of been stuck in ever since. Until when did that, well, when did it pick up to be, to start being Archimoda that is today? Obviously now with the pandemic, everything going on, we've seen actually this year that the orders and the rise of Archimoda has been actually exceptional. So when did it actually start? When did you see that for then, for you thought that Archimoto is finally going on the right path and you can actually see, let's say, the light at the end of the, of the tunnel. I, I would say that the, the real, the, the first real sea change moment for the company was almost exactly six years ago. Um, so our first seven years, uh, we, we were, we kept on trying to get to the goal and not, um, and, you know, we, we, Arkimoto was always sort of like with the three wheeled reverse trike architecture, it was like, you know, th- there's gold in those hills somewhere. And we just, you know, sort of started marching uh, into the space of three-wheeled vehicles. And I, I looked at it as almost like a binary search through three, uh, novel three-wheeled vehicle architectures. Um, and each of those, each of our first seven prototypes kind of got closer and helped learn more about the space. But it wasn't until the inspiration for generation number eight. That was the, that was the first time, and it was seven years in, that I looked at, I basically did a, I, I, it was December 20th, uh, 2014. Um, I had uh, uh, one of my housemates measure me sitting in a folding chair from the tips of my toes to my back and from the floor to the top of my head. And I took that rectangle and I copy pasted it for the backseat passenger. And then I added the swing arm, approximately the size of a swing arm and what I thought the drivetrain was gonna be. And I looked at it and said, this is going to win. Like this, this is, it was the first time in my, in that seven years where I really felt like we had a shot at a big win. Um, You know, each, each time before it was just sort of like, uh, you know, cool, nice try, but you know, your, your princess is in another castle. Um, yeah. And this generation eight was the first one where I was like, okay, uh, I think uh, I think this is going to work. Now, at that time, um, we were hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt. Nobody was cutting any checks. Uh, I had uh, one engineer um, working on uh, re- reformulating the chassis design. Uh, I got a guy named Greg Thompson, um, who's a phenomenal uh, uh, industrial designer out there on the internet. Um, to uh, to start cooking on what the outside of it could look like, and uh, and we we spent basically about three months the f- the first three months of 2015 with a with a very small team, um, just putting the whole idea together in a presentable form. I took that to to the Bay Area in uh, in uh, 
you know, late February of 2015. And that is when we really secured our, our very first venture capital uh, for, you know, the, the company had been angel, friend and family funded for those first seven years. And then I, I, I kicked in obviously the first uh, several million uh, to get it up and, and rolling from the proceeds of Garage Games. But it, was, it wasn't until we had the, the clear disruptor notion put down on paper in a way that, was, uh, that, that really made sense that we were able to secure uh, true venture financing. And then that let us uh, get the looks like works like prototypes on the road. Um, and we launched those at CES in 2016 um, and, and got a bunch of press around that. And then that's when we really started marching towards the IPO. And uh, the IPO is what let us get uh, vehicles through the, the, the process of regulatory compliance and build out the factory. Um, and then, uh, you know, I, I would say probably the, the second true uh, kind of sea change moment in terms of my perception of the company was in August of last year. Um, and that was when, uh, when we finally marched through uh, what was our, the, the sort of compliance gate that had been a, a huge challenge for us from like April through August, um, which was, which was the, the testing of our seat belts and the frame and how all that stuff came together. Um, and uh, we, we had some, just, just we have a, a, a a seating system that's not typical in uh, in in a vehicle because we've got nested passengers and uh, dual seat belts, and so that took us a lot longer, I think, than we had originally anticipated. But when we finally got through that last test, um, that was that was like the the moment I knew that we were going to at least get into production. Uh, and then I would say the third and final um, real turning of the corner came in June of this year. Uh, when the stock first started to really climb, and we did a, a, a relatively modest financing round, a, you know, eight million dollar capital raise, but that let us get out of debt. It let us uh, get a nice head of steam, um, and that, that that just sort of cleared the deck for um, what has been, you know, really obviously a, a breakout year for the company, to put it yeah. mildly. All right, no, for sure, I think. Back then, it was also the first time the, the stock price was above or equal to, to the price uh, you were IPO'd. So it was certainly a, a, a nicer yeah. goal to, to reach finally. We had, we had one glorious day above the clouds in, I think, February of 2019. Uh, it was actually Valentine's Day of 2019, mm -hmm. where the stock closed for the first time above the IPO price, but then it immediately you know, ducked back down. Yeah. So getting to the point where we were um, clear of our initial offering price, where every everyone who uh, who believed in us uh, was made whole in that moment, um, that was uh, you know over over this last summer that that's been a, obviously a, a very good feeling, and yeah. then uh, we've been on a tear uh, since uh, since our third quarter earnings. All right now that we're on the the topic of stock prices, as a CEO of the of the company and the founder of the company. Does stock price, obviously it does matter, but does it really go into your thoughts each and every day? Or do you look at the stock price as just an extra thing? Uh, I, I think it, it is, particularly when we, um, when we need uh, you know, additional fuel for the fire, um, that it, it, it's a very meaningful component, right? The, the, um, because it, it immediately is, it, I mean, it, it's our ability to raise capital, it's our ability to um, uh, uh, acquire loans, it's our, um, you know, sort of the market perception of Arkimoto as a company uh, in terms of uh, our, our staying power and the belief of the market in what we're doing. Um, those are all really important signals. Um, but I would say that on the day-to-day -day level, you know, particularly after we, uh, did those two raises in November? Um, our focus now is is on executing on the plan, um, and so uh, I, I try not to be distracted, and I try to uh, encourage our team not to be distracted by day to day fluctuations in in the stock price. Um, I would say also though the the you know the my ultimate aim with Arkimoto was to uh, it, should it ever be successful that uh, that my own equity in the company would go into a foundation for doing more good works. And so 
uh, the fact that it, it is now actually worth something that my, my holdings are, are actually, yeah, they're, they're, um, worth, uh, I, I think beginning to really pursue that angle as well. Um, and so to the extent that, that the share price enables us to do more good works beyond simply what we're doing at Arkimoto, uh, I think that's a really important consideration as well. And everybody, you know, we, our, everybody on the Arkimoto team is an equity holder. We, we've done round after round of uh, employee stock options um, really since uh, our inception, practically. And so uh, I, to me, it's very gratifying that members of the team who've really stuck it out through some very challenging, uh, the very challenging process of getting a vehicle from uh, the concept stage into actual production, um, a, lo a, lo a lot of blood, sweat, and tears. And so yeah. Uh, to see our team be, um, you know, rewarded in that way, I think is very gratifying. Yeah, for sure. And that's always good to know that, well, when you get rewarded with, with shares, for example, as an employee, then it's also in their best interest to actually deliver every time the best results possible, because obviously yeah. it goes it goes both ways, right? Well, yeah. And I mean, Arkimoto is an entirely a mission-driven organization. I mean, it's, it's baked into our uh, it's it, it baked into our articles of incorporation. It's in our mission statement. Uh, it's in our values. Uh, so, that, and that that's really been what has attracted people uh, to uh, to the venture over time. And and I think really what uh, is is ultimately our our durable advantage uh, in in the market. Um, but it does help when you know people can buy a house or you know pay off a car or whatever. Um, to to have to have that component, and it it creates a, a a real mission alignment and a real company alignment with everybody on board. Yeah, for sure. Now a bit a bit of a pivot towards something more specific. Um, I think a lot of people have seen that that tweet that uh, regarding Elon Musk when Sandy Monroe actually made that clip to ask for help, and then he replied with, "Can't support three wheel three wheel vehicles because it's not safe enough." Now I want to ask a bit about the well, the not safe enough aspect, and then a bit about weather weather problems regarding Arkimoto, because well, it's it's open. So, but we're going to talk about that in, in a bit. But just to to go back to this tweet of not being safe enough. Yeah. Uh, well, and and I I mean that's I, I think Elon's perspective is uh, is is rooted certainly in his own personal experience, yeah. um, and that you know. Uh, but I think the question of safety, if you take a broader lens to it, which is that it's not just about how safe am I if I get into a, a, a crash, but how safe is everybody else based on my choices? Um, and I, I guess I would uh, put forward that we have we have a different way of looking at safety. You know, one is that we are definitely building a motorcycle class vehicle, which are you know, motorcycle class vehicles are, are traditionally regarded as very unsafe. Um, and so we have aimed to build a motorcycle platform vehicle that is as safe as we believe that we can make it. Um, and, and part of that is how we have, how we've ballasted the platform uh, to make a very nimble, very responsive vehicle, uh, dual motor front wheel drive. So you've got two front wheels for traction, two front wheels for braking. Uh, there's a, you have a, a, a cage over your head. You've got two seat belts. Uh, for each occupant, um, and it's a much more visible vehicle on the road than a typical bike. Uh, it's a, it's a much more stable vehicle on the road than a typical bike, uh, but it is very much still a lightweight, ultra efficient electric vehicle platform. Um, we've we've deliberately designed the performance characteristics of the vehicle uh, to be uh, fun from, you know, it's, we, we think of it as sort of zero to fun immediately. Uh, you have, you have got instant torque. You've got a lot of maneuverability. The fun factor of Arkimoto's products happens in the zero to 30 miles an hour range. Um, whereas if you've, uh, if you have a, a performance car, you have a multi thousand pound vehicle at, that is fun in the zero to 60 or zero to hundred miles an hour straight line acceleration. Um, and I think that that can also invite again people to behave uh, recklessly and uh, you know impact the safety of the people around them uh, in a much more damaging way 
than they could do on a on a much smaller, uh, less aggressive vehicle. So, um, I, I think uh, the the point that Elon did make in some follow up tweets was that it wasn't the fact that that it's it, there's nothing about the fact that that three wheel vehicles themselves are fundamentally unsafe. Um, it is. It was that three wheeled vehicles are not held to the crash test safety regimen of cars because they are considered motorcycles. Yeah. And I think there are a, there are a number of three wheeled vehicles out there that 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 claim to be cars, uh, and so I, and I think that's a very uh, it's it's a it's a very risky uh, business choice to make to claim that you are making a car when people have a very clear idea of what. Uh, the safety standards of a car are, and you don't meet that. Um, we have taken great pains to make it very clear that we are not developing a car, that we are developing a motorcycle class vehicle. Um, and, and then over, over the long term, uh, you know, and, and this isn't even super long term, this is in the next five to 10 years, uh, more and more vehicles will be autonomous, more and more vehicles will have advanced crash avoidance uh, capabilities. And all of that will mean that we should be spending less of our, our, our budget of aluminum and steel and copper on uh, dealing with crashes and, and more of it on building uh, lots of very lightweight, very efficient vehicles that don't crash. All right. Now, before I get into the, the battery technology and the autonomous part, regarding weather, because I've, I've actually shown the, the FUV to a couple of friends and families, and obviously, I'm from Belgium, so here it's it rains ninety percent of the of the year. So how how would somebody deal with with weather? Because the FUV is well, is open from all sides, it, basically. Uh, it's funny when, when you uh, very soon we will be releasing a, a video called "Fovin in the Rain," um, where we uh, unveil for the first time our our our, our rain guards, uh, and so you know, like the the the. the original concept is that like an ATV or a Jeep or something like that, that you can put on full side enclosure panels. Um, we have our, our half doors are finally, you know, right on the verge of getting into production and out to folks. Uh, but we have an even lighter weight uh, solution that, that to me is actually better um, in terms of uh, it, it actually protects your lap, it protects your sides. And it, the reality is if you're dressed up to be outside, to be able to get to your vehicle, then you've got on the clothing, all the clothing that you need in order to stay nice and toasty while you're driving the Arkimoto. So we, we're here in Eugene, Oregon, it rains uh, uh, many, many days out of the year here in Eugene. Uh, so we're definitely familiar with that. And the, you, you might be surprised at just how well it does when you're in the weather. And it's actually a really nice experience to be kind of in the world still, um, yeah. but then also you're you're staying dry and toasty. All right, well, good good to know. In and if somebody's listening and are afraid of that, if you ever come to Europe with the Arkimoto, hopefully hopefully soon. Here here's the answer. Now going going back into the technology, battery technology. We've seen battery day and autonomous uh, autonomous vehicles. Is Arkimoto as a vehicle? open to to that integration of being autonomous and obviously having those maybe tesla technology batteries in the future if they're open oh, to sell obviously absolutely <laughs> yeah and, and the idea Ar arkimoto has from the very beginning been conceived of as a platform for autonomy it's just that when we started you know <clears throat> that was in 2007 uh a, the 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 darpa grand challenge had just been won for the first time you know, so autonomous vehicles were were just still very much in their infancy, uh, and 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 I you know I think my, my thought was, until we get there, until we actually have the full self driving capability, then we need very lightweight vehicles that we ourselves drive. Um, but we have always been designing the platform with autonomy in mind, and I think that you what you'll see in in the coming we we talked about this. Uh, a lot in the lead up to our IPO, it's in uh, in our original prospectus, um, and you know now we actually have some resources to put towards it. Uh, although, the, the, so the idea is that by the time that we're in the, in mass production mode on the platform, that that platform will also be able to play host to a lot of different autonomous vehicle technologies. Yeah, because yeah, you do you do software updates over the air software updates. That's right. 
Uh, we, we have the capability to do over the air updates. That's one of the pieces uh, of technology that will be coming online as well. Okay, yeah. that's good, good. It's always useful to, to have that option. Yeah, now, we, built, we built that in from, from the beginning of the production cycle. Just, you know, one, we want to make sure that we've got all the telematics data from the vehicle uh, so that we, we, we have a clear picture of uh, how well it is operating remotely. But ultimately, uh, we want to make it so that we can continue to update the, the software of the vehicle without having to uh, send out a tech uh, to go plug in a laptop or something like that. Yeah, for sure. All right. Now, pivoting towards a more marketing aspect, was it because right now we are heavily relying on obviously when there's an Archimoto on the street, an FUV, everybody is looking at that and it's like free free marketing. Now, is the plan to stay that way or do you plan to use maybe heavy social media marketing or maybe TV ads if somebody still watches TV these days? Yeah, I, I doubt that we'll ever do TV advertising, um, but we we have used uh, social media advertising and YouTube ads to, to I think, very good effect. We, we get... Um, uh, incredibly high engagement on the video pieces that we do. And so I, I look at that as a very efficient way of, of spreading the message. Um, but the, I think to your point, the word of mouth that you get when you actually see them on the road, uh, you, it, our, all of our customers report this back is that people are constantly bombarding them with questions about it. We actually have one of our early customers that is making postcards for all of our other customers uh, that have, he's, he's, he says, you know, send me a picture of your FUV and then I will send you a pack of postcards that you can hand out to people, uh, you know, with your referral code on it or whatever. Oh, that's, so, that's, that's awesome. I, I, and, and I think that that speaks to the enthusiasm that, that our early FUV adopters have for the vehicle, um, as well as that, that real viral factor. Yeah, for sure. Cause it's always, always free marketing when you see something that you've never seen before or that you see rarely. Everybody's taking a picture, posting on their stories or, or whatnot. So it's, it's pretty good. That's also why the deliverator should be a good success for businesses that do deliveries, yeah. grocery shopping, et cetera, which actually is my, my next one. How's, how's that been this year, obviously, with the pandemic? Did you see an increase of interest towards deliverators from, oh, from bigger stores? Sure. Yeah, 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 and and, and we've, only, uh, we've only put a handful of deliverators out into the market uh, as test vehicles so far. Um, we've gotten a lot of good feedback from the early pilot programs with the vehicle. Uh, and I think there's been a lot, a lot more interest generated from, you know, everything from, from very small fleets, you know, uh, mom and pop pizza shops to, uh, to, to actually much larger institutions, cities, and, and big companies looking at that as, as, as a fleet component for, for some of the stuff that they do. And we're, we'll have a lot more to talk about that in the coming months. Um, as, as, as we get Deliberator into more of a, a producible mode, each of them right now is a bit of an art project, um, but we're, uh, we're, we're in the process of tooling up and ver because we're vertically integrating all of our plastics manufacture, that's going to be one of the early pieces that, that gets built out of our own uh, automated vacuum forming line. All right. Like, I don't know if you can say something extra about the, the higher car pilot and the Orlando City pilot that was announced a couple of weeks ago, uh, but yep. if you can. Um, well, we just, uh, th those uh, are ongoing at this point. So we're continuing to receive feedback from, uh, from both. Uh, and I think that there's, there's some exciting opportunity ahead, but those, those, are, those pilots are ongoing at this point. All right, this is great. No, because for, for higher car, it makes total sense for them to partner up with those people that are using Uber or Lyft or like freelancers like that. Uber Eats, whatnot, having an, F, an FUV or a deliverator actually makes makes total sense. And to partner up with a platform like Haricar for me was was like, yeah, for sure. Why didn't I think about that earlier? Because it makes makes total sense. And for Orlando City's point of view as well, for them, it's always sunny. So so the FUV part being open is fine. And then using it as, as a, for them as a city, you can go to the police department, fire department, whatever. Um, it's, it makes makes total sense. Hopefully, there's more cities and counties that that will follow that down the line. I, I think I think there uh, there are any number of cities and states even that have very aggressive carbon reduction goals, and we think that we can be you know a, a piece of that overall picture because it's a a, you know, a a very affordable, very very efficient, 
lightweight electric vehicle that can do a lot of stuff. Yeah, for sure. And it's fun. Super fun to drive. Um, now, regarding obviously 2020 was, was a difficult year. We know there's like lots of backlog right now because of COVID. So how, how does, how is 2021 looking for, for Arkimoto? Uh, well, and I talked about this a bit in our earnings call that we expect that there's going to be a lot of uncertainty in terms of the revenue and delivery picture, particularly in quarter four of this year and quarter one of next year. But the, by the time we hit Q2, we expect that we will have alleviated uh, all of the big supply chain issues that have been tripping us up during the pandemic. And some of those have been related to the pandemic and some have just simply been uh, the fact that this is a new electric vehicle program and some of the components uh, needed, uh, you know, need the right supplier to be able to scale with us. Um, but again, we think that by, uh, and, and probably the most significant one of this, one of, ones of these is our, our vacuum form plastics. Uh, and that's something that we're actually bringing in house to just have total control of it. Um, mm -hmm. but, but ultimately we think that by quarter two uh, and certainly into quarter three and quarter four, um, that will will start to really smooth out the production ramp and and start cranking out more and more vehicles. Yeah, because I th I know you talked about the DOE program and also the restructuring of the product line. Was it with the works with uh, with Sandy Monroe? Yeah. Um, How is that looking? Uh, it's it's looking great. I mean, their, their team is phenomenal, uh, and those some of those bigger pieces and mostly that's about really ratcheting up scale. Um, and so the those elements won't really come into play um, until, you know, sort of 2022 timeframe. Um, but it has been really awesome working with their team. Uh, we've hit some some pretty cool milestones with them actually just this week uh, in terms of um, analysis of the vehicle and kind of uh, baselining where we are now. And that helps us really plan out uh, where we're going for the mass production version of the product. Um, but it's a uh, yeah, I'm 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 very excited about the the our, our team up with Sandy and his team. That's great. Did you since announcing the the Roadster, has there been like an increase in, in demand for that, or did you see many increasing engagement? Uh, I, we we've definitely had inquiries about about it. Uh, we haven't actually officially uh, uh, shown shown the production Roadster or announced uh, options and pricing or anything like that. Uh, so the, the marketing team wants to uh, have their chance to, to to really get that lined up and, and knocked out of the park. But I mean, I had some of our early some of our early uh, investors just were were like basically saying, you know, take my money. Yeah. Uh, I want one of those right now. Um, and and I think once people actually get a chance to ride it, uh, it is it is a it is a truly enjoyable ride. So I, I think it's going to. My, my hope is that it fares very well in the marketplace, particularly in that you know, high end kind of toy price range. Do people that have ordered their FUV, can they change to a Roadster if they want? Oh or? yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, yes. unless you, once you place your, your non-refundable deposit for, uh, for your vehicle, uh, at that point, we're, we're building it for you. So that you have to, you know, t take what you've ordered. Yeah. Um, but for anybody who's a pre-order customer, they can uh, order a FUV or a Deliverator or a, a, a Roadster, uh, whatever they want. Because no, I can I can see a lot of people that have pre-ordered an FUV suddenly seeing that roaster and be like, hmm, might as well buy buy this one. Well, I, I think for for certain markets, right? So for Southern California, for Florida, um, it's 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 a really or if you, if you've got a, a a number of our customers are are retirees who are want to have a tow vehicle behind an RV, um, and the, the roaster is just a, a fantastic vehicle for for a lot of those applications. Um, uh, I think uh, uh, it, it's really, I think it's going to be a split. Some people will want, uh, certainly want the cage and the windshield and the windshield wiper and the seat belts. Uh, and then I think folks who have, uh, and particularly this for folks who have been motorcycle riders uh, for, for most of their lives, um, you get to a certain point where uh, it, you just, it, it's a, you want something that's stable on the ground that you don't have to, you know, lift up a thousand pound bike if it falls over. Um, and so that's where having uh, that extra wheel really comes in handy. And do you still think the 50,000 units per year goal is still reachable by 2022 I was? 
Uh, we're so we're uh, you know we put put out a, a two year time frame on that target, and that's still the target that we're working towards. All right, that's good good time frame. Um, now a bit obviously when production lines and everything is is up to speed, do you see a path outside of the United States, or you are only focused? Oh yeah, yeah yeah. So 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 we I mean we we think that uh, that we we have interest from really from all over the world. Uh, and uh, you know, Europe has been a place where we've had a lot of folks chime in from, uh, as well as from Southeast Asia. Uh, and so, the, really, what we're doing right now uh, with uh, with the the mass production planning process is figuring out uh, what is it exactly that the product is when we're building it at scale. Uh, in terms of the, you know, we're going to some of the parts will be changed um, because they are. Uh, Easy, more more cost effective to build in volume using different build technologies. So going from uh, a sheet metal origami piece to a single stamping, um, it's it's more expensive on the tooling side, but it saves a lot of money when you're when you're punching out fifty thousand a year. So step number one is kind of define the product that we're going to be building uh, for mass production, as well as we design the factory footprint for that. Uh, 50,000 units per year. And actually, the, what we're looking at right now is that there, uh, it's, it's, it's like a, a, if you think about the, the core of a CPU, if you've got you know, a CPU that's got 10 cores or eight cores or uh, 200 cores on your graphics processor, that what we're defining right now is the core. What, what, is, what, is a, what is an Arcimoto manufacturing core look like? And each of those cores, we think will do about 25,000 units a piece. So, the 50,000 unit target, it would be a two core uh, Arkimoto production operation in total. Um, once we have that core designed and we've got the, the mass production product ready to go, then the plan is to open up uh, Arkimoto production facilities wherever the market supports that. So for the European market, we would want to be producing in Europe. For the uh, Asian marketplace, we'd want to be producing in Asia and then just scale up the number of cores uh, to, to meet the demand in each of those markets. Yeah, for sure. Because I think, for example, let's say say Europe, well, in Belgium, the sharing economy is, is pretty big right now with whether it's bird uh, as electric step or, or electric uh, motorcycle from new. I think something like Arkimoto could certainly work here. But moving, let's say, a country like India or, or Thailand, where tricycles are, are super popular, these cities are super dense, like there's concentrated, there's like a billion inhabitants, there's always traffic. I think something like the Arkimoto in those countries would be like a no-brainer if you if, if you ask me. And particularly as we get the cost down uh, and the scale up, we think that there's a there's a real global opportunity for the company. So that's why we're, I mean, one of the reasons why we're focused here is we want to, this is it's it's right in our own backyard where we think it's easiest. Um, to to figure out how to put that all together, but once we get that that really mapped out and solidified, that's when we think uh, it'll be time to to just hit the global marketplace. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, one last thing about the I think it was in the earnings call regarding configurations of the FUV. It's something that you've added in the summer, right? Let when you buy an FUV, you can configure it yep. wherever you want. How? How do you think this will evolve? Because obviously people like to configure their cars. They would oh, yeah. obviously like to, to configure their, their FUV. So has there been like a huge increase of people using that option to configure? Well, it's, and what's, what's on the website now is kind of a beta. It's, it's sort of our beta configurator. It's, it's, our, it's a very good first, uh, first effort at, at getting that done. I think what we're, what, what we're shooting for over the longer haul is something that, that I'm hopeful is, is much more uh, continues to be much more engaging, and I think what we're when we look at at kind of the future of the Arkimoto web presence, um, I think we're gonna we're gonna have some stuff uh, in in reasonably short order that is uh, um, uh, will will break new ground at least as far as as vehicle manufacturing companies go. Yeah, I think con like the configuring part when I heard that in in the call, I was like, hmm, didn't know it didn't it wasn't an option before, but now that it is an option, I was like. For sure, people will use it. Even obviously, they will have to pay a bit more, but it will make total sense. And and for Arkimoto's standpoint, it makes sense. High revenue just by adding this configuration. And obviously, with partnerships for 
other companies, brands or whatnot, I think, I think this could be very positive mo moving forward. I have one, one more thing to add, because um, okay. I think it could be helpful, who knows? Uh, my sister's si my sister-in-law's sister is a, a race car driver, professional race car driver, and stunt driver in uh, the new James Bond and Jurassic World. So, in case you need to go and test your vehicles in the UK or Germany, she, right. she's she's open and up up to. Are do you that. volunteered for the job? Yeah, awesome. Exactly. Well, uh, yeah, maybe we uh, maybe we could see a a a, a 007 uh, driving a, a an Arkhamoto platform vehicle one day. Or you can use it in the Jurassic Park. Uh, that's where you really want a lot of torque and acceleration is in when you're trying to get away from dinosaurs. Exactly. So that makes perfect and, sense. And you can still enjoy the view because it's 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 nice and open. Truly. Right. I think that that will be it. Again, thanks very much for for taking the time. I know now the holidays and, and it's been crazy. I think crazy year for Arkimoto. And just by by the looks of it and hearing everything, I think 2021, 2022 is going to be even better. We are very excited about uh, about the road ahead. Yeah, so I really appreciate you uh, getting me on the program, and hope that your holidays treat you well and stay uh, stay safe safe and healthy out there. Thank you. You too. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. See you.